Here we are live. We'll just wait a couple of minutes until 11 before we start. Okay, so good morning, everyone, and welcome to Manchester in Translation. Um, this is an online conference held by Comma Press in partnership with Manchester City of Literature to celebrate International Mother Language Day. Um, the conference is running off three across three days, so today, tomorrow, and Wednesday, um, and we'll feature our keynote talk uh, along with two panels on decolonizing translation and working with a writer and also three translation workshops into English from German, Arabic, and Bangla. Um, so if you're interested in participating in any of these, just head to the events section of our website, um, commapress.co.uk. Um, so on to today's keynote talk. We're really excited to have Anton Herr with us as our keynote speaker. So welcome, Anton. Um, just before I introduce Anton, I just wanted to let you know that um, we will be doing a Q&A at the end of this um, session. So if you could put your comments and questions in the um, comments box, the live chat on YouTube, then we'll get to them at the end. So just feel free to write whatever as you go along. Um, just to give you a little introduction for those of you who don't know Anton, although I'm sure a lot of you know his work very well. Um, he won a Penn Translates grant for his translation of The Underground Village and also a Penn grant for uh, Bora Chung's The Cursed Bunny, which was also shortlisted for the 2022 Booker Prize and the 23 National Book Award for Translated Literature. Um, his translation of Sang Young Park's Love in the Big City was longlisted for the same prize um, in that year. His translation of Violets was longlisted for the National Book Critics Circle Awards and a finalist for the Firecracker Award. And his co-translation of Beyond the Story, uh, Ten Year History of BTS debuted, de debuted? <laughs> debuted <laughs> at number one on the New York Times bestseller list. And as well as all this amazing translation work, um, Anton is the author of two books, Toward Eternity, which is published by Harper Via, and uh, No One Told Me Not To, which is published by Across Books. So, over to you, Anton. Thank you, Isabella. Okay, I hope everyone can hear me. The Zoom is structured in such a way that I don't know who is listening and if indeed anyone is listening at all. So <laughs> here, here we go. Um, I feel like decolonizing a translation is a lot more important topic than how to pitch a translation, but uh, I guess someone has to teach how to pitch translation. So uh, here we go with that. Um, as some of you uh, aficionados in the audience may know, um, I uh, wrote up this blog post about how to pitch a translation. And I did that because a uh, few people have done it, like Susan Bernofsky has done it um, some years ago, and um, but it hasn't really been codified. It hasn't been really discussed at length uh, in a more formal setting. You like Sometimes you'll have 
awesome translators like Savad Hussein, who is, you know, much more famous for pitching than I am. Uh, like she would teach some um, like workshops and so on, but no one had really just like written down all of their thoughts on pitching. And so I did um, one day um, in a big burst of procrastination and then I posted it on the web and it went, you know, there was very, it, it, I want to say viral because does anything go viral in literary translation world? But uh, it was pretty popular and I was surprised at the um, reaction. So I thought it would be fun to maybe do a presentation on it. And when um, I was asked to do this keynote with the note that said, if you could discuss something that has to do with the business of translation or actually doing translation, that would be great. And I was like, okay. So uh, instead of dealing with a very, very academic topic, I will be doing pitching for translators. Okay, here we go. I am going to share screen. It says host the fabled participant screen sharing. So I'm going to talk to the camera while that is solved. Um, to start off with what, why do translators need uh, to pitch? Well, technically this should not be your job, obviously. Like your job is to translate. Your job is to, um, <laughs> sorry, is it still? Yes, it is still disabled. I don't know what to do. I am very disconcerted. Um, your job is to translate, but unfortunately, uh, you also have, are sometimes uh, asked to come into the pitching process and the submission process because when you sell a book to a foreign publisher, I'm sorry for you guys, it may not be a foreign publisher, it may be the publisher in your country, but when a book is being moved from one country to another, you need to be able to really sell that book. You need to be able to speak that language, understand that language, understand the context of where that book is coming from, and then understand uh, the context in which you are bringing that book into. Now, the uh, um, foreign agent may not necessarily have the English necessary to make a sale in English. The author may not have the English necessary to make the same sale. The um, domestic agent, if there is a home agent, may not have, you know, so it's, it's a whole thing where even if you have a foreign agent, like an English agent, then they don't have the, you know, source language competency in order to this, in order to um, sell it to like the foreign publisher. And most importantly, especially for languages like Korean or Hungarian or, you know, Eastern European languages and Asian languages, it's very difficult to find an editor who speaks your language. So uh, they are completely reliant on the translator to give them the correct impression of what a translator should be. Okay, I am now being told that I can share screen now. Here we go. Great. Okay, I hope you can all see my presentation. So there's no, you don't have to take notes really for this presentation because um, if you Google um, pitch guide for translators and my name, Anton Her together, uh, just, you know, you'll get a web page and basically I, rip that into little shreds and pasted it into a slideshow so that um, we could see what is, what is, so it's better for me to, easier for me to, to present. So why should translators pitch? I just explained, like we're the only ones who have all of the tools in one bucket in order to sell a book. And it's not ideal. I think agents should pitch. And um, someone on uh, Instagram, I believe, asked me, to uh, ask me if like, should we also submit to agents? And this is becoming uh, um, like increasingly we are able to uh, have agents represent us. But even if you have an agent represent us, and I will hopefully have time to discuss a little bit of it uh, uh, during my presentation, even when you do have an agent and even a very powerful agent, that agent still needs your help. And I will discuss the many ways in which you know, that agent will still need your help. But I am an artiste. A translator has to translate. Well, a translator has to be read. And this is a line that I paraphrased from The Wife, starring Glenn Close, where um, someone, an older writer, tells her that, oh, you'll never succeed because, you know, blah, blah, blah. And then young Glenn Close goes, but a writer has to write. And then the older writer goes, a writer has to be read, honey. And that is so true, I feel. Um, 
I think like literary translation can be a very academic exercise. But what really uh, makes you a professional literary translator is your ability to sell a manuscript. I may not be the greatest translator in the world, although I do okay, uh, but I am definitely the loudest translator in the world. And I think that's really what makes me a literary translator because an AI will presumably be able to translate texts from Korean into perfect English. I mean, I'll be long dead by the time that's possible. But presumably, an AI will be able to do that one day. But will an AI be able to sell a book? No, I don't think so. So this is where you, as a literary translator, a professional literary translator, kind of like has your added value as a flesh and blood human being. Thought that sounded cynical. I hope I said that in a gay enough voice so that it sounds cheerful. Okay, so you are your book's best friend. We all have that one friend who not only loves to read, but loves to tell us about the latest book they absolutely love. We listen to them enthuse about the book at length to the point where we feel like we've already read the book. That's what you need to convey in your pitch, the impression that the editor has already read the book without actually having read the book. Um, I don't know if I need to explain this more, but sometimes I encounter literary translators who come up to me and they're like, oh, recommend me a book that I can translate, or what is Korea publishing these days? I want to translate it and be a literary translator. No, you have already failed because you need to be someone who is enthusiastic about books, who loves books. Otherwise, why are you doing this? There's no money in it. So, you know, just so you know, um, you have to do this because you really love books and you have to be the kind of person who is very enthusiastic about books and can be enthused about books in the presence of others in order to sell that book, in order to get that book sold, so that other people will eventually enthuse about that book, if that makes sense. Okay. So, the editor you're pitching needs all the ammunition you can give them. It's not enough for a pitch to impress your editor. Your editor, more likely than not, has to convince several different people in their publishing house, their editorial director, marketing and PR, governing board, etc. If you come from a language like Korean, your editor will not have the tools at hand that will help them in the process of convincing their peers, such as sales milestones, source language reviews, and other information about your author. Who can give them that information? You. Try to give your editor as much ammunition as possible. If the book topped the chart or won an award, no matter how minor, mention it. Look for reviews that describe the book well. If you have or can get funding, mention it. The bigger the publishing house is, the more people that your editor needs to report to. You may think that the entire publishing house is a very well-oiled machine where everyone talks to each other and communication is perfect. Everyone loves books, every book equally and are enthused about it. But it is important to understand every publishing house, especially the bigger they are, as a kind of mini Versailles where you have to curry favor and all the different factions of Versailles are kind of pitted against each other for the limited resources of the king's time. Um, for example, marketing and PR is a very good example. Um, marketing and PR is very, very limited, uh, even in the biggest houses like PRH and whatnot. And so you really have to um, make their jobs easy for them. You know, So if you have any kind of connections or uh, any kind of marketing information or information that might be, you know, useful for publicity. Like maybe sometimes they'll ask you like, oh, could you do a video so that we can show it at London Book Fair? And I always say yes to whatever marketing and PR <laughs> tells me to do <laughs> um, because I know how difficult their job is. I know how many books they have to, you know, take care of. And so I want to make their job as easy as possible. I want also, very importantly, to make the books as discoverable as possible so that when people see a book like Your Utopia, published by On First Star by Bora Chung, when people see a book like this, they're like, oh yeah, I saw that somewhere. And so I'm going to, um, so they pick it up and then they at least, you know, take a look at a bit of it inside and buy it hopefully. So it's very, very important that you give your editor as much information as possible. Uh, and these are some of the uh, kind of like things that you you put into a pitch in order to make their lives easier. But bear in mind that your editor will also keep asking you for information. And 
The thing is, the way that they word it, again, this is very Versailles, is that they'll be very polite about it. They're not going to be like, oh, you have to give me this information. They're going to be like, you can give me this information if you want to, but you can also not give it to me and it's fine. Whenever they say something like that, then you definitely have to give it to them. Like, just give it to them. <laughs> so I, Anton Her, I'm telling you that you have to give it to them. Okay. Because, how do I say this? So the way sometimes that we pitch is that we go to lunch and a much more famous translator than me taught me this and I can't say their name, but uh, you go to lunch with an editor and you pretend like, you know, oh, you, you know, you just met, but you pretend that, oh, you know, we've been friends for such a long time and blah, blah, blah. How are your kids? Blah, blah, blah. What have you read lately? Blah, blah, blah. Oh, by the way, here is a book that I'm translating. Like you very casually take it out, like in the middle of the conversation. It's not even like, like, you know, the purpose of the meeting is to pitch a book, but um, it's the Versailles of it all makes you kind of like hide it under all of this, you know, very polite, very, <laughs> very, um, if you say it in a nice way, I guess it's, you know, professional cordiality, which is great. And we love cordiality, but it's also sometimes very like, why does everyone, like, if you don't know that's how it's done, then you're kind of like, why does everyone behave like this? And then it, some, for some people, it takes a while for it to kick in, but yes. If they ask you for something, I, I recommend you give it to them because they really need it. They really need it to convince their CEO and all of their other editors and their editorial board and, and whatnot. So case study Counterweight by Duna. This was published by Pantheon. This submission had an agent uh, and a really nice agent. However, um, the agent, um, I am better positioned than the agent. I was better positioned than the agent was to provide the editor with what they needed. For example, uh, they needed an extended sample and they asked for it very nicely because they know that samples are very often like not well paid. And so to ask for an extended sample is like asking for more work that's free that you may never get compensated for down the line. But I was so intent on being, you know, on selling this book that I said, yes to an extended sample. It was about, I think we, I think we did about like one more chapter. It went from, it was already, I think around 5,000 words, which is what I recommend. It's a nice sample size for an Asian language, but maybe like it went over a bit more from there. And so I provided that extended sample. And um, I also did a radio segment at the time called KBS World FM Korea Book Club. And I featured the book in that so that I would have an entire script where I talk about the book for 15 minutes and I sent that script to my editor so that my editor can know more about the book and be able to talk about it and defend it in all of the meetings that he has to take. So um, I'm very reluctant to say that every translator has to do this. Like obviously not every translator has to do this and every translator should not do this. In fact, no translator should do this. However, um, it depends on how much you're willing to give, I guess. But I do recognize that this is extremely problematic. And me saying that this is something that happened for me and something that worked for me is kind of perpetuating what is essentially a very, very problematic practice. I completely recognize that. I'm only saying this as something that I have done historically. I do not do this for every one of my books and I would not do it for every one of my books. It is just something that you can keep in mind, you know, as something at the back of your mind. There'll be times when you have the resources to do it or have the inclination, the motivation to do it. And other times you'd be like, no, this is too much. I'm not going to do it. And don't do it. Next, what goes into a pitch? So this is what's going to go into the body of the email that you send to your editor. Dear name of editor. Do the research, make sure that you name your editor. Do not simply say, dear sir or madame, or to whom it may concern, the whole point of pitching is to convince this book is perfect for that editor. You need to convey the sense that you are familiar with the editor and publishing house and that your book is perfect for it. So you kind of, as a translator, I mentioned this before, but you kind of, as a translator, need to know who is publishing where, what kind of books are being published, and what editor put out what book. It's very helpful to know that because it saves you a lot of time. I see translators who don't do this research and then they just submit to like 15 different publishing houses. I have never submitted to 15 publishing houses 
I think the most I've ever done is three. And that's because when I do research, I mean, there are certain criteria, every translator has their own criteria. One of the, one of mine used to be like, oh, you've never published a book from Korea. You've never published a book from Asia. Then I know that you're not going to publish me. So like, I'm not going to climb that hill. No, thank you. Um, my, my mind has changed a lot about that since then, but yeah, there are certain, like, uh, there are certain publishers that, you know, is not, you know, a good fit for your book. Like, for example, like not everyone publishes science fiction. That's just the sad reality of it. So you definitely have to do a lot of research and, um, ask people around about, you know, editors. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit more about this in a bit. So, um, your... Opening paragraph should say who you are and something that would pique the interest of the editor. It can be a detail about the book, whatever fits into one line, the fact that you've met the editor. Um, just like have a little hook that will catch their interest. This is important because depressingly enough, uh, most editors of most houses, they get like, you know, a hundred submissions a week. There is no way that they can really, even if they wanted to, the, and they do want to, believe me, but you like there are just too many for them to pay too much attention to so they have to apportion their time they have to apportion their attention we only have so much attention like in the course of a day so you have to make it easy to be remembered i'm not saying that you should like you know sh send them you know a, a telegram or you know a singing telegram or whatever but i am saying that you need something of a hook that um that will just that will just like pique their interest and give their mind something to hang on to so that they will remember you somewhere down the line, uh, especially when you have to follow up. <laughs> and uh, yeah, you will probably need to follow up at some point if they do not answer in, let's say, two weeks. Okay, uh, what is next? Comp titles. I don't want to talk too much about comp titles because so many people make such a big discussion about comp titles, especially on Twitter. And I'm like, this is not that interesting a topic. But um, so the end of the opening paragraph is where I usually drop comp titles, which are the titles of books that are similar in vibe with your book. For Cursed Bunny, I mentioned Her Body and Other Parties by Carmen Maria Machado and Mouthful of Birds by Samantha Schweblin, both edgy literary horror written by women. Try to find comp titles from books that the editor is likely to have read or at least heard about. If you can find a comp title in the editor's or publisher's backlist, that's even better. Nothing older than three years. I think though with translations, there's a bit of a more leeway with the three year thing, but in general, try not to use a comp title that's like too old and books are better than, I mean, I've seen people like use Netflix things as comp titles and sometimes it works. I mean, God, did I, did I pitch Curse Bunny before? Yes, I pitched Curse Bunny before Squid Game, but if it were the other way around, I definitely would have mentioned Squid Game. You do what, you know, you do what you need to do. Okay, one line synopsis. Around here, I create a subheading that says one line synopsis and provide a punchy one line summary of the book. For Curse Bunny, it was something like a collection of fantastical feminist stories ranging from literary horror to science fiction. And I do this because sometimes, because you, you have to be able to summarize your book in a sentence. And then we have, you know, the people who are like, oh, if I could summarize my book in a sentence, I would have just written the sentence and not an entire book. Yes, I know, we know all that. And we know that, you know, you live in a cloud and whatever. But you still need to market your book and you still need a hook. You still need something that the editor can hang their brain on once more. They, um, and this is very, very useful to have a one-line synopsis, especially because there will be opportunities sometimes like at London Book Fair, where you just run into an editor and then you do an elevator pitch. So you have basically, I don't know, 20 seconds to pitch a book. 20 seconds is a long time. You can sell a book in 20 seconds. I have. I think Chris Bunny was sold in 20 seconds. So yeah, one line synopses, definitely, definitely recommend. I think everyone should have one and your pitch to start with one. And then there's a detailed synopsis. So I make another subheading that says detailed synopsis and provide a detailed but under 500 words. Basically a page, synopsis of the book, including every plot twist and ending in spoiler. If it's a short story collection, summarize each short story by title. Remember, the goal is to make the editor feel like they've already read the book, or at least have an extremely good idea of what it's about. Um, 
sometimes I will read, uh, I ask, you know, my, I get asked to read over pitches all the time. And when I, this is like the one area in which uh, translators make the most number of mistakes with detailed synopsis. They try, they make a synopsis that's kind of like, you know, the inner flap of the book or like the back of the book where they're like, and then something happens, aren't you intrigued? And I'm like, no, you have to give away the ending. You have to give away the spoiler in the detailed synopsis. The, uh, the editor has to feel like they read the book, like they actually read the book. So um, yeah, uh, you can mention that, you know, this is a spoiler or in a twist ending, blah, blah, blah. Like you can say that, but try to uh, give them everything, but also don't make it too long because editors are human beings. And I don't know if they'll read over a page synopsis. Like, I feel like that would be too much. Okay. Reviews and accolades. Um, <clears throat> translate a line or paragraph from a couple of reviews. Blah, 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 blah. It's late at night in Korea. Okay. Uh, no, it's not. It's only 820. Uh, translate a line or paragraph from a couple of reviews from newspapers or prominent blogs. You want to show what people in the source language are talking about regarding the book. Get any chart or sales information you can. Number one bestseller in the science fiction category at Kyobo Bookstore, the largest offline bookstore, bookseller in Korea, etc. If it won any awards, mention them. It doesn't matter if the editor has never heard of the awards or not. Awards are still an indication that the book didn't completely sink into oblivion upon publication. Mention if it's been translated before what and what those reviews say. This is a bit tricky if you're coming from markets like Korea, where uh, book sales are a very well-guarded secret. Like, I barely know how many, like I published a book last year in Korea that I wrote in Korean, and I barely know how many copies it sold. And I was told, but whenever I get a royalty statement, I was, I'm always told like, this is a secret, do not tell people, like do not hint at people like how many books you sold. I don't know why we do that, but we do that. Okay, so um, you kind of have to make a guessing. Um, although the, for example, for Korean books and for a lot of uh, books from other territories, although like they don't say like how many book copies they've sold necessarily, sometimes like you can look at the back matter or the front matter and it will say, this is the fifth printing. And I'm like, five printings, that's actually very, very promising. So you mentioned that, five printings, whatever gets you, whatever piques the interest of the editor. Can you get funding? Mention the hell out of it. Um, so Korea, like a lot of people misunderstand Korean funding to be like really like abundant and easy to get. But in my experience, I feel like Spain actually has more funding than Korea and uh, territories like Scandinavia uh, are actually a lot more intelligent with how they apportion their funding. Most of Korea's funding goes to this stupid little school that LTI Korea runs. <laughs> Anyway, so um, instead of, you know, actual translations, come on. Um, so if you can get funding, though, you should look up the structure of that funding. Um, for example, like Pen Translates, um, Penheim, what's the other one? Pen Presents and, you know, languages uh, like funding from your source languages. And yeah, uh, mention that, um, you know talk to someone from uh, committees from those funding groups just to see like what kind of books get picked like look at past winners to see like what kind of books get picked and then maybe use one of those past winners as your comps yeah but funding you know people pay a lot of attention to funding they pretend not to they're like oh you know literature art but no when you mentioned funding like if you go to places like um What's the really commercial one? Not Berlin, Frankfurt. If you go to Frankfurt Book Fair, um, I, I heard that like the, a Korean editor went and then the first thing that every foreign publisher asks is, oh, can you get funding? So, yeah. Okay, author and translator biographies. Don't forget to put your own biography. Oh my God, I have, I've seen so many like translation proposals without the translator's biography. Proposals that are written by the translator, like, this is not the time to be modest. This is the time to, like, pretend you're, you know, as attention poorish as Anton Ver and just like, oh, 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 you know. So this is not, yeah, don't be modest in your, in, your, in your own proposal, please. Oh, and don't forget to add your contact information. This is also hilarious to me. Like, how could you forget to put your contact information, like, in your proposal? Like, who are they going to contact for more information? Who are they going to contact for an offer? They have to be able to contact you, honey. So put your contact information. 
have a website where you have like a form that people can send emails to you through, like have that, all of that for me. I have gotten so many entire books, entire series of books through that little email form on my website. You should be Googleable and you should be contactable. Okay. Snippet. This is something that I like to do. But at the very end of the email, after your signature, I add a paragraph long snippet from your sample as a taster. I suspect most editors don't bother clicking the sample attachment if they're on the fence about the pitch, but giving them a taster might help tip the scales. So I am sure all the editors watching this open every attachment and read every single proposal like from beginning to end. But for the minority of editors who are not like that, I suspect that they basically read maybe a paragraph of your proposal and then maybe the one line synopsis and then they stop. Or they may read like skim over the full synopsis and then kind of scroll over like the author biography, the translator biography, and then they stop and they don't click the, the sample attachment. Like, again, everyone is a human being here. We love everybody. We love editors. We love everybody. But everyone is a human being here. and. I understand that. And so sometimes it's nice to just have like the snippet as a kind of taster, like the most shocking, the most sexiest, the most like delectable part of your sample, just like put it in there, you know? So um, just to like pique their interest. Sample, this could be an entire like presentation in itself. Normally as a uh, translation sample from the book must include the beginning and onwards until the word count hits 2,500. If it's a European language, uh, that is, you know, well read, like uh, I call them the figs languages. It's like French, Italian, German, and Spanish. Everyone else, 5,000 ish words, uh, depending on the language. So please do not translate an entire book before you've sold it to a publisher. I've seen people do this so many times. Do not do this. You are ruining the ecosystem. Also, like, what happens if you translated this entire book on spec and then you find out that? someone else gets the book or someone else is publishing the book, you know, and, you know, this, I've seen that happening time and again, do not translate the entire book. The, and that's what makes pitching translation so tricky. Basically, I always, I always compare it to editors having to buy a car without being able to test drive it when there are so many cars that they can buy that you can test drive. And that's what makes selling a translation so tricky. You have to be like, I know you cannot test drive this car, but it is an amazing car. And let me tell you why it's an amazing car. Like you have to be a car salesman. And I know people hate that, but that is what you have to do. Okay. Um, da -da 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 -da. I think that's enough for the sample. Submissions. So this is the actual submissions process, which um, there's so much to talk about, but let me try to... <laughs> Save as much time as possible. Agent-only submissions. Um, this is the rule, especially for America, where uh, almost no publisher in America will accept a direct submission from an author. However, the one exception is translators. We can submit like agents can submit. It's uh, they don't like to make this fact too public because they don't because you know editors are already deluged with manuscripts and they don't want more manuscripts. But it's kind of like an unspoken rule that um, translators can submit. Um, I recommend trying to find an editor. Uh, oh, it's it's down here. So how do you find an editor? Um, let's go to the third one real quick. Find editors, ask around, maybe a translator in your language combination. The really the best thing is to like think about uh, books that you know the books that have been published that are kind of similar in vibe to your book. And then figure out who the editors are for those books. I mean, there's going to be like bookseller, like the bookseller. I don't know what you have in the UK. Is it the bookseller? Like there's Publishers Marketplace in America. And then so you can like look up who acquired the book. And then you can try to find out like have the contact details for, for that editor. Sometimes they're on LinkedIn. And so you can say that, oh, I met you on LinkedIn. But the best thing, again, these are the rules of Versailles, is to go through someone who has already worked with that editor or who knows the editor in some capacity. That's the best thing because, uh, how do I say this? Publishing is very, very insular. Now, comma press is extremely meritocratic and you know they're not like this at all, but 
everyone else. Mostly, most publishers are very insular and they don't know what exists out there necessarily. And so their most trusted sources are people that they've already worked with. It's already, you know, a very, very, it's very, very common knowledge that most jobs in the world are um, given to you through like people that you already know, like through networking. It's It's not so much like there's an open kind of like like those jobs are not so common as much as like, oh, my best friend's father, you know, knows a guy who is looking for someone and then they need a Korean English translator. Like, do you think you're blah, blah, blah. And then that's how you get the job. Yeah. So unfortunately, that also is the case in the Versailles world of publishing. So because it's so insular, that's why you need to network. And that's why you kind of always need to be like, well, not always, but like you need to be quite social. And I know this is anathema to a lot of translators who get into this business because they just want to translate. But very few translators um, get things given to them. Like most translators, we have to get our own work. And that means putting ourselves out there. Okay, uh, submission windows. So some publishing houses do have submission windows. And I will not say that they don't work because I sold indeterminate inflorescence through a submission window. Do I have a copy to show you? No. Uh, I sold indeterminate inflorescence through the submission windows for Sublunary. I have never met uh, the editor in my life. Um, I just thought that the things that they published and uh, the book that I was flogging, which was a very strange book, I thought, well, Sublunary feels like the only publisher really that would bother publishing. We bother even looking at this book because they like weird things and I have a weird book. So I gave it to them and they loved it. They immediately bought it. Like it was almost instantaneous. And so I have not not sold it through open submission, but more often than not, um, manuscripts that I have submitted through open calls have been rejected. But that leads us to um, the third to last point. There is no such thing as rejection. I mean, not really. Because even if you do get rejected from a publisher, quite often, if they like the sample, and if they still like the proposal and they like the idea of the book, it's just not right for them now, but they still like the idea of the book, they will remember you down the line. Or you can remind them, hey, I submitted this and you gave me this really nice rejection. Um, here is a different book. Uh, I'm wondering if like you would be interested in it. And um, and they'll be like, oh, yeah, the, you know, she's that translator that we talked to like at London Book Fair or whatever, and she had a really interesting project. And uh, let's take a look at this one. So. Sometimes, um, and that happened for, and that's how I sold, that's how we sold Counterweight, essentially, because uh, I met uh, the editor for Counterweight at Alta, where I pitched a different book, and then he ended up buying this other book down the line. Okay. Um, da -da 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 -da. And also, even if you do get a book rejected, like, you would have, this is something that Lawrence Schimmel told me, uh, he's a Spanish translator. Does he also do Portuguese? Anyway, he does a lot of languages. Um, this is what Lawrence Schimmel told me, that your, every time you get rejected, it's like an opportunity to learn more about that editor who rejected you. Like, oh, they don't like this, but they kind of mentioned that they might like this. And so uh, he would sell a different book to them. Or like they would mention something about the pitch that bothered them. And then so he would fix it and then he would send it to another editor and it would be sold over there. So it's a it's a whole dialogue, it's a conversation, it's an ongoing, you know, discussion as to like, where will I place this book? The um, great, great translator Jeremy Tian was one of the things that he told me very early on in my career that gave me hope was that there's so many publishers in the world that it's very difficult to imagine that, you know, my book will not find a home somewhere. And so far, he has proven to be correct. Don't romanticize publishers, except comma press, we love you. Um, how long should I give an editor? I think maybe like, I would say, I mean, editors are so busy. I would say like maybe two weeks. I do do simultaneous submissions, but I stagger them. So what I personally do is I give a publisher two weeks and then I send it to another publisher for two weeks and then for another publisher for two weeks. And then by the time this one would have come back to me or not, and if one of them comes back to me, I immediately contact the other publishers and go, hey, so I'm having some interest on this manuscript. Like, maybe you can bump it up in your queue. And they're like, okay, I'll bump it up in my queue. And then they read it. And yeah. So um, 
it's a lot of juggling. I recommend having, you know, spreadsheets because that's what we do. Okay, that is it from me. Um, I am now ready to answer questions. Hello. Thank you for that. That was amazing and very, very uh, informative. We had a lot of questions come through. Um, I think this one, the first question kind of leads off what you were just saying. So you often pitch something to one editor for two weeks and then you, after two weeks, you send it to another. Um, but when is, how long should you keep pitching a project uh, before you give up? When is it time to say like, okay, I've, I've pitched it to all these editors. I've not heard back. When should you just kind of just give up on it, basically? I don't know. It depends on like how how long you have the right to pitch, I think. And if you followed up like twice with like every editor and like if they ghost you, for example, after like two follow ups, then I think it's safe to say that, oh, maybe you should move on to another editor. But again, there's so many editors, like, how can, I don't know how you would stop pitching unless, I don't know, the author, like, comes up with a new book and you want to start promoting that book instead, or, but for the most part, um, sometimes I will pitch something that I translated years and years and years ago, indeterminate inflorescence was, was that, for example, and I kind of like, I, I pitched it to a couple of poetry houses in America and they both rejected it. And I was like, oh, okay, I'll just, poetry is not my thing. Maybe I will translate this entire book. Um, it's very short. So I think for something like that, it's better. And poetry, someone told me, this is very toxic, but someone told me, uh, a poetry editor told me that for poetry, like they prefer the entire collection to be pre-translated. I'm like, that is really screwed up. Like, do not say that to me. But I'm just like reporting to you what this very prominent like if I say his name, everyone knows his name. So that's what he told me. So um, I was like, oh, maybe I'll do that for this book because I love this book so much. And then I forgot about it. And then I just submitted a sample and then it got sold. So you never know where down the line that, you know, an opportunity for that manuscript may arise. I think um, as, after I got uh, my, my Booker nominations, I've had editors come to me asking me like, oh, can you show me something that you have? And so, yeah, you never know. You never know what's what's going to happen. Right. Um, also, uh, you were saying about how you shouldn't, obviously it was an exception in that case, but how you shouldn't translate a book in its entirety without a publisher. And you said that it ruins the ecosystem. Someone asked sort of what you meant about that. Maybe you could kind of expand on how it's not a good idea, basically. <laughs> because it creates unrealistic expectations because if one person starts doing that and like especially if very prominent translators like do that if they do things if they accept things like i don't know like they're okay with not accepting royalties or um i mean there are cases i i used to be strictly like oh you're not going to give me royalties like i'm never going to work with you but i've kind of like mellowed on that a bit as well but but like, if you're not gonna give me royalties and a big fee, then, you know, it's this is a very like, if you're gonna do work for hire, you have to give me a lot of money. That's the way it is. Um, like stuff like that. Like there, there are certain practices where I feel like if we start normalizing things, like translating an entire book on spec before we sell it, then that creates a very, very dangerous ecosystem for literary translators in the long run. Especially like maybe if, if your book is, I mean, maybe like, you know, maybe you translate Japanese novellas for a living. I don't know. But like, if you translate like really big books, like if you're Damien Searles, then you don't want to translate that on spec. Like, <laughs> yeah, that's what I mean by it's dangerous for the ecosystem. Yeah, fair enough. <laughs> um, so um, is it common, someone's asking, for translators to regularly request rights catalogs um, from publishers? in order to find their next project, as opposed to just reading widely and finding something that they're interested in? Like, do you request rights catalogs? And is that a common thing? Wow, that is a great idea. Why didn't I think of that? <laughs> yeah, I used to do that. <laughs> <laughs> I support you. Um, the way, I mean, uh, this idea of discovering a book in a catalog, for me is a little odd. 
but I am old. So maybe this is what the young people are doing now. Um, for me, discovering a book is about walking into a bookstore or a library and then seeing a beautiful cover and then picking up the, picking up the book and then being like, oh my God, I can't believe this book exists and you know, having it change your life and then you running around trying to get it sold. So because that has been kind of like my experience so far, I can't really imagine doing that. Although I do know that you know, even Korean publishers like make, make rights catalogs but um, whenever I see books that are like in that form, it's never really inspired me. <laughs> but maybe, you know, I'm everyone has a different style. So maybe, you know, you should this this is your style. And that's great. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I've got so many questions coming through. I'm just struggling to choose. <laughs> um, <laughs> So someone's asked whether you need to acquire uh, foreign rights before you pitch to an editor in the US or the UK. No, but you need to make sure that the rights are available at all. And you need to email your search language author or publisher. If you're in an Asian language, normally it's like normally the publisher takes care of that. The source language publisher takes care of that, um, like especially in Korea. And the author doesn't, although I still recommend you contact the author first because then it's just good manners. And the author can defend you, you know, when um, your source language publisher goes to your author. So you have to, it's just an email. Just say, hi, I'm a translator. I would like to make, a, I love your book. List the reasons why you love your book. Be very, very, be very, very persuasive. And then be like, I, I want to submit it. Um, be specific, like I would like to submit it to these publishers in these countries, uh, is it okay if I do that? And they'll either say, no, someone else is already doing it. Or like, you know, this book has an agent, maybe we'll connect you and maybe you guys can work something out. Or uh, they'll most likely like, for the most part, in my experience, they say yes. And they're like, oh, okay, well, you know, we're not doing anything. So why don't you do all of this work for free? <laughs> More problematic labor, but Oh, uh, so why don't why don't you do that? And so uh, it just takes an email. Like this whole prospect of like getting the rights sounds like very dramatic and very like big, but it's really just you know getting an email, getting permission, and then of course like as soon as you get an offer, you have to convey it to whoever the rights holder is, which again is usually um, the source language publisher and the writer uh, in East Asian languages. In Korea, like it's about like eighty for the eighty percent for the author and twenty percent for the source language publisher that's how the rights are structured but and so you but you still have to get like permission from both um this question is kind of moving away from pitching specifically now um but somebody on twitter has asked how you approach a translation for each uh book you work on like do you have a process and is it always the same or does it kind of change depending on what it is and who the author is oh yeah it's completely different. The voices are different. The like the pastiches I use are different. Um, I always use this example, like Love in the Big City, where uh, by Sang Young Park, published by Tilted Access Press in the UK, where I was trying to figure out how to make him sound like the way that he does in Korean. And so I asked him, who are the authors that um, that you like who, who write in English, who are translated into Korean? because then I'll get your, I'll get that cadence and then retranslate that into English. And then he's like, oh, I like Chuck Palahniuk. I like David Sedaris. And I was like, wow, you, I can totally see that. You will, you will sound just like them. And so I kind of like channeled a lot of Chuck Palahniuk and David Sedaris when I was doing Love in the Big City. And that was really, really helpful. And obviously for different authors, it's going to be like very, very different. Some authors need more intervention than others. This isn't necessarily because they're like bad authors, but because some authors are just like, for example, Kyung Suk Shin is super cosmopolitan. And so she like reads everything. She, write, she, she reads every translation. She watches every movie, like whether it's a foreign film or a domestic film. So she is actually like, I think she she has this idea of like being a writer of the world, not, not just a Korean writer, but like I write for the entire world. And that's very helpful for her translators <laughs> because um, there's something about her her very clear language that's very easy to translate. Some authors are not so like, some authors are much more, idiot, like very, very 
how do I say this, like idiosyncratic in the way that they express themselves. And like, for example, Blood of the Old Kings was very, was a little tricky um, by Samuel, uh, Samuel Kim that's coming out um, from Tor. I don't know if it's coming out in the UK. So this is a fantasy book. Fantasy is not a genre that I read a lot in. I read a lot of science fiction, but not fantasy. And so I was very, I wasn't very confident going into that book, but um, eventually I figured it out as I translated it. And for each, not so much each book, but for each author, I have, there is a period in which I have to figure out what this author sounds like. And I'd say like around 40% of the book, the beginning 40%, I'm like experimenting. And by, by the time I hit 40 or 50%, sometimes, unfortunately, 60%, I'm like, oh, okay, I know what you're and then I get to translate faster and then I go back and revise. So uh, yeah, it, it's it's different for every single author. What I want to tell, uh, especially aspiring translators, uh, emerging translators, is that don't be afraid of an author where um, you're like, oh, I don't know how to translate this author. Like that's where the fun is, like figuring out how to translate the author. So like, if anything, if you find an author that you're like, oh, like, I have no idea how I'm going to translate this. Like, you're going to learn so much if you handle that author. So maybe think about translating them. That's very, very good advice. <laughs> um, now, um, someone is asking about having an agent to represent them as a translator. So uh, can you share the pros and cons of that? And is it something that you recommend people seek out or like, is it a good thing for people's careers? What What's your kind of take on that? Yeah, my take on this is very, very complex. So, and whenever I bring this up in conversation, even with like super professional translators, like it's a whole thing where some like, and a lot of translators are against the idea. So in my case, uh, so I'm a novelist and my agent who handles my writing also handles my translations, but she was my uh, novel agent first. And I asked her to take on my translation after unspeakably horrible things happened to me last year in the industry where I was convinced that if this happens to me one more time, I will leave translation and possibly publishing forever. I do not want this to happen to me ever again. And I will throw money at whoever will make these problems go away. And I was like, oh, wait a minute, I have an agent. So why don't I talk to her? And I'm very lucky because she is in the same agency as a very, very famous translator who also has an agent. And so she was able to kind of like access that institutional knowledge like within the agency. And not every agent has that knowledge to has enough of that knowledge to represent a translator client. Like a lot of agents can represent authors, but very few agents can represent translators. There are agents who can represent translators, there are very few and far between. I think you can count them on one hand. I think there are like, I've only heard of four. Oh, five, I've only heard of five, yeah. So it's it's very tricky. If you can get one, then that's really great. But if you can't, then uh, the objections that people raise to getting, uh, an, that translators raise to getting an agent is that, oh, but they take, you know, 15% of your already very small translator fee. And I'm like, well, I don't know how other translator agents operate, but my agent, you know, more than makes up for, for her commission in terms of like the more money that she, you know, gets me. So I'm, I, that it's not a problem that I deal with. Um, the other thing is, I guess, but the other thing is like, I translate so many books and I'm not even the most prolific translator I know. And what we don't have in, you know, in the magnitude of deals we have in volume, you know, so if, if you can imagine like a translator, like, you know, Frank Wynn, Jeremy Tiang, you know, um, Aruna Vasudha, like, you know, they, they handle so many books and I feel like for an agent, this should kind of be a no-brainer because quite often those books are already sold by the agent of the author. So you don't have to do any selling. You just have to do the 
through the negotiation, bringing your bringing your trans clients pay up and then like, you know, make, making sure their rights are insured and, you know, making sure that everyone pays up at the right time. Like, and, um, but not everyone is as intrepid as my agent. So I can't really, it's very difficult to say that, to say with, you know, uh, unbridled, like, I, I can't be like, oh, yes, everyone should get an agent. Like, it's very, everyone in a land full of unicorns and, you know, rainbows should get an agent. But I know that this is very difficult to have in practice. Right. So it's more about like finding the right person rather than definitely seeking out an agent. Yeah. 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 Okay. <laughs> yeah. If an agent is asking you like, oh, can I represent you? Like maybe mm -hmm. ask them like what agents or what translators they represented because there are translators now who have representation, but it's very rare. It's like very rare. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, so what would be, obviously a lot of the people in the audience are like emerging and inspiring translators. Some of them might be finishing degrees, um, in languages. Um, so what would be your top three tips for someone who is just getting started in the literary translation world? Mm -hmm. The number one thing to remember is that you are so much more important than, um, it may seem to you because without the translator, nothing happens. Editors don't know what books exist. Agents don't know who to represent. And the work simply does not get done. Um, I recently had a friend who uh, I kind of, who's, who's trying to get a, who's negotiating a deal and the publisher said something to the effect of, oh, like, you know, if you don't like this deal, then we can get another translator. And I got so angry when I heard that. Like, if they said that to me, I would have been like, oh, go ahead. <laughs> Why don't I go find a Korean translator of my caliber who has this experience in publishing, who will do it for the terms that you present and see what product you get at the end of it. I support you. I know they can't. Like, I already know that uh, because I've been on around the block so many times uh, that although it looks like there are a lot of Korean English translators, there really isn't. Like, you, sometimes a lot of, a lot of, you know, translators like are flaky or unprofessional or they don't understand what it takes to translate an entire book because they've never done it. They're not very literary. They translate like they're AI translators. And I'm like, you know, if that's the case, then why should we give you a job? And instead of an AI, like they don't do all of the kind of like, there's no, there's no added value to having you as the translator, but most liter most like literary translators and emerging literary translators also, especially emerging really, because I'm like old and, you know, very like, I have no energy and whatever, but you know, emerging translators, they're very passionate and they're very focused and they're really the people that we need to keep in our industry and we need to retain in our industry. But our industry is just so opaque and difficult and so punishing that, um, and that they, that we, it doesn't like, we gaslight emerging translators. We're, we're always gaslighting them and being like, oh, you're not that important. You're very common. You are very important. You're very common. You are the most important like element. You're the linchpin in all of this. So you, I want emerging translators to remember that, um, to remember that you are actually very rare. Even if you're in like one of the figs languages, like you're still really, really rare. Your perspective has never been seen before in the world. And so you kind of like, it's important that for our industry and for our, the ecology of our industry that you keep pitching and giving us like, and making, making editors see like what work is out there. Like that's really, really important for us. And I'm sorry that we can't that we haven't been supporting you as much as we can. We're making effort. Um, I guess the second thing is to always be super professional. I mean, because you'd be surprised, like, yeah, you'd be surprised. <laughs> and the third is I recommend because I came from technical translation before I did literary translation, and that just gave me a lot of confidence in my work and kind of allowed me to make uh, better choices. Um, 
it's it's in other words like have a day job that you know you can always go back to or that can sustain you throughout this process because it takes a long time to publish a book it takes like at the very least like you know a year and a half and you're basically only paid for the translation part of it and the pay is divided like it's very difficult to make a living as a literary translator so have something that could tide you over I don't know about other language combinations, but for Korean translators, like we are still very much in demand. So uh, you could make a lot of money. And I hope you do not go to those sub industries and that you stay in literary translation because we really, really need your talent. Um, so kind of on that subject of Korean translators, you've uh, obviously Korean cultures having like a bit of a moment uh, at the moment, like obviously everyone loves like K-pop and um, there's a lot of Korean TV on Netflix at the moment that people are watching. And there are people like you who are translating like very successfully um, from Korean into like Western languages. Um, do you have any advice for people who are kind of working with languages that maybe don't have that culture boom surrounding them at the moment? Like, do you, do you have any suggestions for how they can kind of like carve out a place for that language and kind of find a like create a buzz around it I guess I would like to tell the people who think that that it is completely not the case okay for, uh. <laughs> I think last year was special because we had like 20 Korean books published or something but uh normally maybe we get maybe like 10 Korean books published every year mm -hmm. it's just that the Korean books that do get published punch way above their weight and so everyone thinks that Korea is everywhere. It really isn't. Like we, it's just that we do so well with the very little that we have that it looks like, you know, everyone is doing whatever. But, you know, Korean books get rejected all the time. And just because someone watches a K-drama doesn't mean that they're going to read a K-novel. Like I always say, like, you know, just because like, you know, some foreigner loves Blackpink, it doesn't mean that they suddenly have the urge to read a Hwang seok young novel. Like that doesn't happen in Korea. Why would that happen in the Anglosphere? Yeah, it's ridiculous. Like it's a weird generalization that people have, mm. and I, and I'm like, rest assured that we are suffering <laughs> <laughs> as you are. <laughs> yeah, the, the one exception that you know, um, that RM from BTS, like if he recommends a book, then you know his fans, you know, he will at least take a look at it, and that's I'm very very grateful for that. But aside from that, like, I don't know. That's um for me, it was before you know. Squid Game and all of that like for me what I was very intent on in the beginning of my career was to change the face of Korean literature and translation I was completely sick of middle-aged Korean men literature where there are all these like men in their 50s and 60s who are reminiscing about their time as student activists in the 80s and I'm like no one wants to read that but why does why do like, you know, the Literary Translation Institute of Korea, for example, like why do they keep promoting these people like in their publications and whatnot? I want to read science fiction. I want to read, you know, fiction by women. I want to read, you know, poetry. And I want to read a nonfiction, Korean nonfiction. Like I want to read all of these things that, that Korean translators in the generation above me are for some reason reluctant to translate. Not that they seem to be very, um, like they actually, what divides their generation and my generation is that my generation pitch, like we do the pitching, they don't pitch. They basically are hired by outside forces to translate books. But my generation, we had to create our own jobs. And so I was like, well, I'm not just gonna do what everyone else has been doing. I'm going to change the face of Korean literature in translation. And that's why I came up with Curse Bunny. That's why I did a gay romance. That's why I did, you know, all the books that I've done. So it's not so much as like finding a national angle, mm -hmm. I guess. It's like try to come up with something surprising, you know, something, try to break something, I guess. Like maybe there's an incredible Lithuanian novel that we would never have imagined would come from Lithuania. Let us read it. You know, there has to be something. Every culture, every literary culture has something that breaks the mold. So maybe look for that. Great.
Um, well, unfortunately, we've come to the end of our time. Thank you so much, Anton, for your um, talk and all the questions you answered. I mean, we couldn't get to every single one, but I think we've covered most of it. <laughs> um, it was all so informative. Um, so, yeah, thank you very much. And everyone who's listening, we've still got uh, two more days of Manchester in translation. So definitely come uh, come to some of our other events, the Decolonizing Translation panel and working with a writer. You can stream that for free on YouTube. So great. Thank you very much. Enjoy the rest of the, the conference and thank you thank for having you. me. Thank <laughs> you. Bye.